Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invitation to come join you here today. Nice snowy day at the University of Alberta. It's a true honor for me to be able to come and learn about the stuff that's happening here. And as Sarah and I were speaking about this morning, um, I think there's a lot of similarities between our two institutions. And so it's a great opportunity to learn with and from one another. So what I'm going to uh, do in my presentation today, I'm hopefully going to spend the first hour uh, with a bit of a presentation to leave a lot of time at the end for question and answers. Uh, saying that though, we're a bit of a smaller group. So if you have any burning questions, feel free to ask them um, as we go. And I'm happy to, uh, to, en to entertain questions uh, throughout the presentation. So I'm first going to start with a bit of background on learning through experience and we'll then move on to definitions and key attributes. I'm going to talk to you about a new concept that we've been discussing at the University of Toronto called integrated learning. It's been of our strategy to address the multiple pedagogical approaches to addressing learning through experience. I'm going to talk about quality criteria and my ideas for advancing practice in this area and next steps for where the field is going to be going and questions that we need to be considering broadly across the country. So um, we're currently in a phase in which we are rethinking higher education. Um, it's a misconception to think that we are talking about just building on new experiences to our academic programs. Experiences have always existed. Uh, we have always offered opportunities such as co-ops, uh, work study, uh, practica. Uh, what is new at this point in time is we're going through a period of time in which we are rethinking the purpose of higher education and what higher education looks like. And looking at these activities as not just ancillary to education, but rather a core and fundamental part of the higher education experience. Some of the reasons why we're uh, rethinking higher education is because we're seeing a drastically changing needs um, for learning of the students. So students no longer want to have a professor talking at the front of the room and learn exclusively by that professor imparting knowledge on them. Uh, I know from my own experience, you have a class of a couple hundred students, you think that they're actively taking notes on their computers, only to quickly do a walk around the room and see they're all actively on Netflix and YouTube um, and social media. Uh, they all want uh, the PowerPoint slides ahead of time uh, so that they don't have to come to class, they can just study the slides and regurgitate for the exam. So maybe it's just me, um, but my understanding is, with my colleagues said that this is becoming more the norm. Um, it's not just the student expectations though that are changing, it's how they learn that is changing. Uh, their education coming all the way from daycare through elementary school, through high school, their pedagogies are changing there. They are trained to learn differently and so they're coming here with different uh, preferred learning styles that we have to be aware of. Uh, with that, we're also seeing uh, growing demand um, for the teaching support and requirements required of our faculty and our staff across the institution. Um, looking at the needs of community, questions about what is the purpose of higher education and critiques of the ivory tower notion <coughs> that higher education institutions are just a building in which we create knowledge by ourselves, for ourselves, and what is the relevance between the higher education system and that of the broader community around us. Uh, there is more and more recognition of the need for institutions to give back to the broader community, but importantly for that, that relationship to be reciprocal and for the contributions to be community-based and identify themselves. The other reason why we're thinking higher education is because uh, for societal considerations. So as a result of the recent economic downturn, uh, the government at both the federal and provincial levels across the country are all talking about uh, how do we produce students that are ready to meet the demands of the future labor market? How do we produce career ready students? Um, this has obviously posed a lot of questions in higher education about whether that is actually the role of the higher education institution, and if it is, what role do we play in that? Uh, but that is where we're seeing uh, at least government perspective on this issue and the call for more experience. So, in response to this call and rethinking higher education, we are seeing more and more emphasis on learning outside the classroom. This information is out of date. This was a study done in Ontario in 2013. At that time, almost 50% of first entry university students uh, were completing a work integrated learning experience and almost 70% of college students. I'm fairly confident and can almost guarantee that these numbers are significantly higher at this point in time now. 
The reason, one of the reasons why this number is going up, many of you are probably well aware of this, is the Business and Higher Education Roundtable federal recommendation in 2016 that 100% of Canadian post-secondary students benefit from some form of work integrated learning prior to graduation. Okay, so what are we talking about? Uh, we hear the Business Higher Education um, Roundtable talking about the need for work integrated learning for all students. Uh, we as in at higher education institutions use the language of experiential learning more broadly. Um, in the province of Ontario, we had our government recommend experiential learning to avoid the term work integrated learning. Um, but what are we actually talking about? So Experiential learning is a pedagogical approach to how individuals learn through experience. Uh, the most classic uh, researcher in this area is Kolb, and there's a number of aspects to his theory, one uh, being the learning cycle. So the idea that students best learn through experience when they engage in hands-on practice, some form of reflection, some sort of critical thinking and abstract conceptualization, and then the concrete, um, or sorry, the uh, um, opportunity to take risks, try different things, and implement their ideas uh, back into practice. So ultimately, um, there's a lot of different experiences that students can learn from as a part of their time at university. This can include internships. This can include uh, community-engaged learning. Uh, this can include a really great frosh week where students uh, engage in an activity, reflect on that, and learn from that. If it heats the tenets of experiential learning, then they learn from that. It can include participating on a sports team. It can include, uh, some colleagues would argue, a great guest lecturer or a video in the class is an experience that someone can learn through, okay? So I say this in that it's an excellent theory and pedagogical grounding for enhancing the learning quality. However, it can be applied to any experience in which anyone can learn from. There's other bodies of work. So the field of community-engaged learning has a strong body of scholarship behind it. This has long existed um, and is specifically about creating course-based experiences where students engage in a meaningful way with community organizations, most often nonprofit community organizations, and there's reciprocal learning um, and benefit uh, to meet the community identified needs. Um, this here uh, has core tenets with it. There's uh, a body of work that talks about recommendations, best practices, uh, theoretical critique of the field itself. Um, and this is distinct from the body of work coming out on work integrated learning. So work integrated learning um, is a, another pedagogical approach. This talks about the deliberate integration of work experiences with educational experiences. <coughs> it is also exclusively tied as course-based academic credit bearing. Um, and there's emerging work coming out that talks about the quality criteria, such as the authenticity of the experience, the likeliness of the experience to the student's future career, the uh, opportunities for the student to develop skills of employability. Interestingly, uh, a framework on work integrated learning has included uh, so multiple examples, including community engaged learning. Those scholars though in the field of community engaged learning would actively resist and say that the practice of work integrated learning is fundamentally in opposition to the values of community engaged learning. Um, so this is, and they're, they're correct. Um, the other challenge that we have in recognizing these two areas is that they are exclusively tied to academic credit bearing experiences. Where we all know that across the institution, um, there are some amazing academic and curricular based experiences for our students, but we also have a whole body of work on the co-curricular and extracurricular side that are equally val valued to our students, and we need to consider it within the holistic student experience. So at the University of Toronto, we've come up with a term called integrated learning. Um, and this was developed to intentionally integrate the different pedagogical approaches that individuals might apply to practice. Uh, this was developed so that instead of debating over terminology, uh, recognizing that individuals will ground their work in the pedagogical approach that makes the most sense to the purpose for which they're designing the experience, 
but ultimately strives to create an umbrella term so we can recognize uh, the commonality that we all have and what we're all working towards together. So this new term um, uh, is uh, referred to as a pedagogical practice whereby students come to learn from the deliberate integration of experiences in educational and authentic practice settings. And we define this as the integration of the three following variables. So one is disciplinary outcomes. And so it should be some way in tie to the disciplinary study of the student. This can be done in a number of different ways. It may be embedded within an academic course or program in which the students are specifically engaging in, uh, in the practice for the sake of de uh, developing and achieving learning outcomes tied very specifically back to that discipline. Or it could just be transgenderly in which students are asked to reflect on their experience and just talk about how it is relevant and ties, ties back to uh, what they're also <coughs> studying while they're here. There's some form of a community engagement. In this way, we're using the word community very broadly. This can be com engagement with government, industry, businesses, nonprofit community organizations, other educational institutions. But they're engaging in some sort of meaningful way uh, with populations, with ideas, with projects outside of the traditional classroom context. And the last part of this is that there's some sort of transferable competency development also embedded. So it's not just li linking the community engagement with the disciplinary outcomes, but we're also thinking about those transferable skills. And importantly, we actually know that these are all embedded in almost everything that we do already, but articulating these more clearly for the students so that they're more able to articulate them clearly uh, post-graduation themselves. These competency developments can be, it can be the skills of employability. I like to think of it more broadly as communication, leadership, teamwork skills, and helping the students recognize the development in these areas. So one of the big questions that we've had, um, in the province of Ontario, uh, um, we have recently had a differentiation framework implemented, which has called for the uh, universities and colleges across the province to identify our unique strengths um, and quality indicators. The idea is that these would eventually be tied to funding levers. Um, as a part of uh, this differentiation framework, identifying quality criteria, one of the big questions, uh, the big asks that we've been talking about probably for the last 18 months, is how do we track and monitor um, and record and report on experiential learning opportunities? So with that, there's been a lot of work that's gone into developing definitions and typologies of specific examples for what may count. Um, I can tell you that there's been multiple groups working on projects, curricular, or co-curricular, small institutions, big institutions. Not surprisingly, everyone comes up with very long lists. Um, one of the most common approaches is do a broad mapping of the institution. You come up with every name that exists at that institution, put it all on a piece of paper. Uh, you end up with having, and put the definition next to it, you end up having common definitions across them. There's more commonality across your different terms than there are differences. So one of the ideas that I propose, and we've made some progress on at the University of Toronto, is thinking about a purpose and outcome driven typology. In thinking about how you talk about different forms of experience, it's important to first articulate why are you, why are you doing this? So for me, the reason why we would engage in a typology, I'm less concerned with the tracking. Um, yes, we're gonna do that, it will happen. Um, but I think that can't drive our work. Our work has to be driven by ultimately enhancing the quality of what we're doing. So when you have a purpose and outcome driven typology, you then would distinguish based off of the quality criteria, the pedagogical grounding of that experience, because then that would help you to identify how you would improve that experience. Um, it can also be uh, divided based off the administrative requirements. So one thing that we get asked all the time is I'm just starting up a new experience. Uh, what do I have to consider? Is there health and safety insurance requirements? Is there non-paid placement agreements required? What about research ethics? Uh, so the other benefit of having a purpose and outcome driven typology is that you can then narrow down the buckets of administrative requirements that should be considered relative to each of the forms of experience. So this is a work in progress and it will always be a work in progress. Uh, where we're at right now is with the four, the six main areas. 
Um, the first four really being grounded in literature and the last two really being um, specific to our institution. So the first one is work term. Examples of this could be co-op, internship, work study. Ultimately, in addition to enhancing student learning, the purpose of this is to enhance employability and transition to the workplace. Um, the, some of the theories that I would ground the work of this area in include workplace pedagogy, work integrated learning theories, and some of the administrative requirements would be uh, employer contracts, for example. Organization partnered projects, this is when you partner with an orga outside organization for the sake of completing a student project. It is more project based than it is uh, work based. So examples could be applied research, a workplace project, entrepreneurship. In this context, the purpose in addition to student learning is to develop knowledge, products, technologies, new services. Uh, this is generally grounded in theories of knowledge exchange. It is, uh, um, and the things that you have to consider would be intellectual property, uh, research ethics boards approvals, if it's research based. Um, thinking about then community service learning. This is a term um, I will acknowledge uh, we have flipped on numerous times. So at the University of Toronto, our scholars uh, actually resonate more with the term uh, community engaged learning um, for a number of important reasons. Across the province though, the word service learning is still highly used. And so this was intentionally created as a hybrid between the two of them. Um, the reason why that it's a bit of a hybrid service learning has been traditionally um, considered exclusively academic credit bearing and community engaged learning is more flexible and so we wanted to make sure that we kept that flexibility so it could be curricular or non-curricular. Um, but this could include uh, community engaged learning as well as community based partic participatory action research. You, you will see the research intensive flavor of our institution um, <laughs> throughout this uh, which I'm sure you share here as well. Um, Again, in addition to student learning, the purpose of this is that it uh, is reciprocal learning that meets community identified priorities. Some of the literature that you grounded in is service learning um, and some of the administrative requirements would include, uh, for us, it's consistency with the Employment Standards Act for non-paid student trainees, um, so non-paid student agreements and any health and safety insurance that needs to be put in place. For a placement, uh, this is could be a practicum, clinical placement, field placement, popular in fields of professional fields, healthcare, education. Um, this here, in addition to student learning, is disciplinary competency development and generally experience for professional licensure or certification. So uh, this here is often grounded in experiential learning, uh, situativity theory, uh, proximal development theory, uh, and some of the Key administrative considerations, again, are for that of non-paid placements. These are generally unpaid um, experiences where students are engaged and paired directly with a mentor in the organization. The last two I mentioned are very specific to our institution and current institutional priorities. So international experience is one that admittedly could be spread out throughout the previous four. Uh, they could easily be, a work term could be domestic or could be international. This is an institutional priority for us at the moment, and so we've decided to pull this out as a separate bucket. Uh, the other reason for doing that is because there are some niche uh, learning outcomes and niche administrative requirements. So for instance, for international experience, in addition to student learning, uh, there's a focus on global and transferable competency development, and we have to think about safety abroad. The last category uh, is probably the one that's the most contentious, and this is the in-class slash other experiential learning. Um, and this is a bit of a catch-all for labs, research intensive courses, simulated experiences. Um, this, I will acknowledge, may not necessarily require engagement in the community in the same way um, as the other ones and may not actually meet the tenets of what I would define as integrated learning. However, it's important for us to recognize that these are still experiential learning opportunities that are extremely valuable and prioritized and important for our students and important for us to be facilitating across the institution. And one of the risks with defining integrated learning is that it makes people feel pressure that they have to define everything they're doing as such. And so this is intentionally created so that people can resonate and identify some of the great work that they're already doing with a separate category. Um, it also allows to distinguish when some of the other more intensive administrative requirements are not required. So in these cases, um, it's a broad focus on learning through experience, uh, and importantly, there are generally not additional administrative requirements um, 
in these, in these situations. So if you're running a lab, a tutorial, uh, case-based study, no, you do not need to have insurance set up for your students in the room separate than the general liability insurance of the institution. Okay, so all this talk about what is what, what counts, what doesn't count, how, what do we label it, um, it's important, it's a part of our conversation, is a part of moving this field forward. My personal opinion is that it's, it's a little irrelevant. Um, we're going to talk about these terms, this terminology forever, and we're going to keep on changing that. As educators, we really need to stay focused on quality and making sure that we are focused on the quality of what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we can enhance the quality of what we're doing, and not just tracking it, monitoring it, reporting it. So with this, um, one of the questions is, what counts as a quality experience? So I have a quick exercise for us. I'm going to pose a series of questions, and I'm going to ask you to acknowledge whether you agree or disagree. So the first question, all integrated learning experiences should be recognized with academic credit. Agree, disagree. Okay, all learning, integrated learning experiences should be recognized with academic credit. Agree? Disagree? Okay, so why the disagrees? I know you thought that you came here to listen to me talk <laughs> and that I wouldn't make you talk. <laughs> okay, so it could be a bit of a barrier. Okay. Any other comments? Should everything be given academic credit? Can you just assume that they're all the same? Yep. <coughs> yes. Okay, any other comments? I think students can find their own, I think we control some of what we offer as learning experiences, but I think students find their own. And um, employability is one, mentorship, there's lots of ways that they get yep. some of these experiences that would be hard for us to quantify as well. Okay, excellent. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. by the learner. Yeah. So, you know, so, so who's in charge of identifying the material that our students have to grade? Yeah. It's usually the educators. Yes. Or part of the, the, the system that we're putting in place. Yeah. Now, to on the flip side, a student may argue that the credit is almost their token. They put in the time, they've done something, um, and they want, yeah. and they, and they say, well, I put in this time, I did learn something from this, why aren't you recognizing me for the work that I've done? Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, next question. Okay, in order for an integrated learning experience to be effective, there is a minimum number of hours students must spend in the workplace or community organization. So there is a minimum number of hours they must engage in. Agree, disagree, uncertain. Okay, agree. I'll go for agree. Okay, <laughs> disagree. <laughs> and a lot of non-voters. Okay, agrees. Running. I guess for me, ultimately, I think we learn because we're spending time. And so to quantify your question as um, a, a chunk 
length of time can be is just inextricably linked to the learning of the child. Okay. Any other comments for agree? There should be a minimum. Yep. Um, and they're investing so many hours in, in creating this placement and then supervising and listening to students. So as well, what is it that you know they need from a student in order to make that and truly make that much more impactful for the time that they're spending? Okay. So you're saying the minimum may exist in combination with the learning outcomes and what's maybe required to achieve that, as well as might be the demand from the community in order to enhance the recipro reciprocity of that experience for both parties. Yeah, it, it kind of ties back to the previous comment in that um, without saying the word relationship, you're almost talking about building relationships and the time it takes to engage in a meaningful way with the individuals that you're working with. It's not just going through a turning door. Um, in and out, I breathe, I breathe the hair for two seconds. <laughs> I've come out a new person. Um, okay, the disagrees. Yeah. And we hear that from students all the time. It was one experience for three hours for one hour, and that has stuck with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Want to add to that? Okay, last well, one. And I'm just thinking about prior learning assessments that are required as well. How do we, you know, if we're looking at an integrated learning experience, and let's say somebody comes to the table with lots of experience in a certain area, um, right? Yeah. Like, why does yep. it have to happen here in this place with that? You know what? Mm -hmm. Just to kind of make no, and that's a that's a, a question that we are getting. Um, I say across our our co-curricular programs, how can we take advantage of students' experiences before they come to the institution, their summer jobs, um, their broader experiences, and help enhance the learning through that? Is it something that we can facilitate uh, to enhance the learning and their interpretation of those experiences that are fully facilitated and, and occur um, outside of our our institutional programming? Interesting. I have a hard time saying that there is a minimum requirement for the kind of assessment that they should receive before learning about the experience. Okay, thank you. Okay, next one. Paid integrated learning experiences 
are more beneficial for students than unpaid experiences. Okay, any other comments on this one? I would disagree because in our faculty they are not paid and I get pushed back about it all the time that I am working for two months and I'm not being paid and yet I am paying students to teach them. <laughs> Okay. We pay our students to come up with the hours and days, but I'd love to find out from each school member or the tuition versus that. That would be a great project to yeah. learn about that. Okay, any other comments on the paid and paid? Yes. Well, I think the unpaid versus paid is beneficial for the students, but the question that I'm willing to be asked is if exploitation happens to the students. That's a different question. Students themselves, it's beneficial, but it's more beneficial sometimes for, especially companies, to get free labor. Yeah. And that's why you find that you don't expect to be paid in the future. Okay, and so this is, and this is why I love posing these questions. So I'll tell you the flip side of that argument. And the flip side is who are we exploiting? So on the one argument, you can say you're exploiting the students for unpaid labor. On the other side, we can say, are we exploiting the organization for unpaid mentorship, unpaid supervision, unpaid mm -hmm. education? Um, and so the question is, uh, for whom is this labor relation uh, challenge most appropriately directed? Okay, last one. When facilitating an integrated learning experience, all interested students eligible to participate must be able to do so. So when facilitating an integrated learning experience, all students eligible to participate must be permitted to do so. Agree, disagree, uncertain. Okay, agree? Disagree? A lot of people on the fence. Okay, let's start with the disagrees. Can I clarify the question first? Yep. Well, how many people do you let into the course? Uh, do you have to, should we have a cap on courses that offer these experiences? Oh, okay. um, the, uh, they're, they're intentionally worded to be confusing. <laughs> I think you guys are catching on to this. <laughs> um, it'd be easy, if I phrase them nicely, then, uh, then we wouldn't elicit the great discussion that we have. Um, but yes, uh, ultimately, uh, this is kind of what I'm for me is getting to is engagement for all in access. So uh, should everyone, we know that there's a lot of resources uh, th that go into these. We know that there's often a lot of work, partnership development. There's often a certain finite number of spots available. Um, should we have caps on these things? So should all students that are eligible um, to participate be permitted to participate? Um, or can we have caps? Yes. So I would say yes, but then the question is, are they or are they not? And how much, how much support is there for caps? Okay. Anyone want to jump on that one? So you know, I, I think we do need to find ways, and I think we at the university are also a community, um, and so. 
So I think if you're creating a you know, child as a website, which I mean, I, I work here, um, so I think, <laughs> I, I think I do it. <laughs> I so. Maybe they have that table that's going to come next month. <laughs> so I think we have a lot of opportunity to create experiences within our own community here um, that is as real um, yep. as the real world. Um, yep. I mean, Is also a safer environment. Um, but if we're saying, um, and I'm going to go international again, and Doug would love that, um, or maybe not, <laughs> <laughs> um, right? That's a different thing, right? Yep. That's a different kind of integrated learning. But I think everybody should have an opportunity to do something, some experience, whether it's actually the most messy experience you've ever done. But, um, oh, it's messy, and, and you'll and hear me even being messy. But, but providing a continuum. Um, and I think using our own campuses, our own organization as one of those Excellent comment, and thank you for uh, bringing up that the point about the real world work experience. I think that is uh, um, it is a common language that we talk about real world experience, assuming that what happens at the institution is not a real world. Uh, I take my job very seriously; it's real to me. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you for highlighting that. Any final comments on this one? Is that a Okay, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, maybe someone's not prepared for a specific experience, maybe they don't have the capacity. That those are all totally legitimate. But what else could we potentially uh, send students towards so that they can have a different type of experience or an opportunity that A may make them more ready, more prepared, um, but also you know, doesn't shut them out on the front end in terms of creating a safe workplace for them. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I hope what you realize through these questions is that there is no right and wrong answer. When I first got into this field, um, it was with a research contract and where I was asked to evaluate um, internships across the province and how much they're paid and how many hours students complete, with the suggestion that there'd be recommendations coming out for a minimum amount of pay and minimum amount of hours. Um, I was surprised by these questions, and personally, I thought that they were quite irrelevant, um, especially when being funded by a Ministry of Education and being facilitated by higher education institutions. I very quickly returned the question and saying, shouldn't we be talking about educational quality? Um, it's in, these are good questions to ask. I can understand why they are being asked, but ultimately, as educators in this field, I don't think that these are black and white answers. There's a variety of experiences, there's diverse experiences that students can engage in. There's no one way to engage in this um, form of learning, uh, but ultimately we need to be talking about how we actually ensure there's learning that happens. So in this context, the term pay, the term hours, the term credit was associated with quality. These were the quality metrics by which we were determining, or uh, I say we very loosely, <laughs> um, were being determining what makes a quality experience. Assuming that quality is tied to the amount that students get paid, the amount of hours that they put in, um, when we all know that you can have very rich experiences that develop over time, you have scaffolded learning the longer you are in an organization, but there's very impactful meeting experiences that can happen in a very short period of time. So what are the quality criteria by which we should be thinking about when facilitating these experiences? So I have a number of points here. Um, the first is authentic exposure. So authentic exposure is uh, defined in literature as on a continuum, considering two variables. One is the authenticity, so the proximity of the student to the quote unquote real world. Um, and so whether they're actually in a physical environment, um, engaging in the day-to-day -day activities of that particular um, setting. The other variable is considering the likeliness of their activities to those of the day-to-day -day activities of the organization. So a really high authenticity would be you're in an, or an organization doing the day-to-day -day activities, 
medium authenticity would be in the organization doing an independent project or at the institution uh, practicing the day-to-day -day activities of that organization. Um, and the lowest authenticity would be at the institution doing a project with the organization. Um, so it's not, it's not mirroring the day-to-day -day activities and you're still here at the institution. Another variable for considering quality is purposeful experience. So experience has to be grounded in and tied to embedded learning outcomes. There should be a reason why the students are engaging in that and that uh, the learning is purposefully developed um, and activities are specifically created with learning plans for the sake of ensuring that learning is a priority from the onset. Third quality is connection to the academic course and program. So there should be some sort of connection to what they're actually studying at the University of Toronto. Uh, sorry, at the University of Alberta here. Um, so when you're talking about this connection, this connection can be interpreted very loosely, very different ways. Again, I mentioned, I mentioned previously, it may be truly embedded within an academic course. It could be embedded within an academic program, like a co-op or a practicum. Um, or it could be a co-curricular, extracurricular activity in which there's some sort of uh, activity embedded within that in which they are asked to relate it back to in some way their time here at the institution. But there be, should be some sort of thoughtfulness put into connecting the two experiences. There's some transferable skill development. So this should be uh, articulated and identified um, and so that students are recognizing what else they're getting out of the experience. Uh, yes, I love sports psychology and I hope that when students are on their experiences that that's all they're thinking about is the theory of sports psychology. Um, however, it's also important to make sure that we're embedding and recognizing the other transferable skills that they're getting out of that, the nonverbal communication, the conflict um, management, uh, and the skills that will ultimately transcend, transcend whatever field they go, may go into after they study here. Uh, the learning should be assessed. This can be done in a number of ways, uh, but it ties back to the, the idea that it should be deliberate, so that we should be assessing the student learning in some way. Uh, it gets into formative, summative uh, learning assessments, different modes by which we can assess it. There's no one way it has to be done, just we should be assessing learning in some capacity. And it should be recognized. So uh, that can be recognized with academic credit. It can be recognized at the institution in a different way. Uh, for us at the University of Toronto, we use the co-curricular record to recognize a lot of our co-curricular experiences. It's still being recognized on a student's, um, a student's record in some way, um, and it's being recognized as uh, an experience that in learning experience the student did engage in. And the last way is that it should ultimately be theoretically grounded. So we have to remember at the onset, the reason why we're facilitating these practices is because they're an approach to learning. Um, and in no other context do we just talk about learning for the sake of learning. Um, there's a whole body of work and scholarship on teaching and learning with a variety of pedagogical practices. There's no one pedagogy that it should be grounded in, but everybody should know what their beliefs on are on knowledge production, on education, how they believe they see themselves as an educator, and ultimately it would enrich the work that they do in this field by grounding themselves personally in a pedagogical approach that makes the most sense to them. So there are a number of theories that can be used, too many to even list. Um, so just as some examples, experiential learning theory is the one that I speak to uh, regularly because I think it's common and transferable across a number of different domains, disciplines, activities. Uh, but other popular theories include situated learning theory, action theory, pedagogy of the workplace, uh, critical education theory, transformative learning, and the list goes on and on. The three that I'm going to show right now are some of the three big ones that uh, colleagues of mine have resonated with across our institution. So first one, that being experiential learning theory, where the focus of quality here in this pedagogical approach is focused on the quality of the learning experience for the student. And it's generally grounded in the four tenets of hands-on experience, reflection, critical analysis, and experimentation. Uh, the next one is service learning, uh, which focuses on uh, ultimately a service um, and a benefit to the community organization. Uh, a popular framework for this is Dan Buten's uh, four R's, and this includes the respect, reciprocity, relevance, and reflection. Uh, the other approach that I see used commonly, particularly co-op, internships, professional experience years, um, is those if work integrated learning theory. 
And that's when the quality criteria is tied to criteria for employability. And some of the key attributes include authenticity of the experience, preparation, debrief, integration, and assessment. So what you will notice is that there's some similarities across all of them, but there's also a unique foci. Again, depending on the focus and the primary purpose of that particular experience. The one common thing that we see across all of them is this word reflection, um, which I'm sick of talking about. I'm sure you guys are sick of hearing about. I'm sure students are really fed up with and they are certainly experienced the concept of reflection fatigue. Um, but the reason what you that we talk about it all is because we see reflection embedded across all three of these. And so this is why we often then deduce all pedagogy to um, experience and reflection. So ultimately, the value of the experience and the quality criteria by which you use to evaluate and to ground your experiences, I propose depends on the perspective that you have. Um, so this is a very classic, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, do you see the old lady or the young lady? Um, and ultimately, if you look at it long enough, you see both. And so. I say that and we spend a lot of time talking about what is a quality experience and we throw cri quality, quality criteria up there as if they apply uniformly across all experiences. Um, and I think that what we're actually looking at is more of a landscape like this um, in which uh, we're all achieving the same picture but we're going to see the picture in different ways. And uh, as we see the picture in different ways, we have to recognize and appreciate and respect the diverse perspectives that other people bring and how they see the, dif the picture and our end product and ultimately um, allow for the flexibility and grounding quality in different pedagogical frameworks. Okay, so I'm gonna spend my um, remaining time talking about advancing integrated learning. Uh, what I mean is not necessarily just scaling up, but where I think that we need to be thinking of as a, f as a field most generally. We talk about uh, what counts, or what is it defined as, what makes a quality experience, um, I'm speaking to what I believe are uh, the converted. These you are most likely the individuals that are here because you believe in quality experiences. You have a good idea of what you're doing. You're already grounding your work um, in excellent practice. This to me is where I think that we need to be moving our conversation. Um, these are the topics that I think that we need to be thinking of as leaders in this area moving forward. Uh, these are the challenges that we're going to be having five, ten years from now. Um, the distinct distinction between just starting and where do we actually see this field going. So four main um, variables that I'm going to talk about. The first is creating, not just labeling. So uh, I think with all the attention right now on work integrated learning, experiential learning, integrated learning, whatever we want to call this, um, for some of us, it's exciting. Some of us, it's a recognition of what we've already known has been a huge value add to our students. Um, most of us have been facilitating this in our disciplines for decades. This is not new. And so it's nice to see it being recognized for its importance and for the impact that it has across students in the higher education system. With this, though, there's also a push for more, more, more. Um, how do we get more people facilitating this? How do we get it in more academic programs? How do we get it in more courses, more co-curricular experiences? Um, and how do we track it, build in the metrics to show that we are doing it and how many students are doing it and how often they're doing it? So <coughs> where I say is creating, not just labeling, is I think that we run the risk as we draw more attention to this field of wanting to label everything as such. And I encourage us to think about understanding what we're doing, why we're doing it, and actually taking this as an opportunity to create more experiences in this area, and not just simply impart a label on things that have been done previously to other experiences that are in the gray zone and could potentially be that. It's an opportunity to take some of these experiences on the periphery um, and ground them in the pedagogical practice, enhance the learning experience through those, and in a sense, create an integrated learning experience not just label it as such. So the perfect example is what uh, was raised earlier in that we know students are engaging in experience in meaningful ways unrelated to their time here. So they bring experience to what they do, they might engage in experience um, when they're not in courses here. Um, this would be a perfect example of avoiding the tendency to or the uh, possibility of just labeling that 
than is integrated learning. Well, they did, they were off, they were in school, and then they did something in the summer and they worked, and then they came back. So that is integrated. Um, and actually see that as a real opportunity to say, well, what could we facilitate to help them get the most learning out of what they did during that summer term in the workplace? Um, connect it back in a meaningful way with what they're doing here, and in a sense, create an integrated learning experience um, through that. So there's a lot of opportunities like that. We know students engage in experiences in a vast amount of ways, and it's about leveraging those experiences and turning that into a learning experience. So some of the ways that we could do this is to, um, a lot of focus on curriculum mapping. Um, this, I believe, is a focus across the country. Um, Many of you are probably already familiar with the idea that there is now growing amount of institutions across the, um, the country, universities, colleges, and the growing amount of hybrid institutions, uh, which has ultimately led to conversations about quality, quality metrics, and curriculum mapping, which actually show how course learning outcomes build into program learning outcomes and pr uh, um, build into then accreditation and quality council monitoring um, at a, a provincial level. So when we talk about curriculum mapping, we, ha we got this down packed in our programs. And I say that you know, loosely because uh, being someone myself who's going through uh, a self-study this year, we have it down packed. We got we to gotta get our, our materials together. But we generally understand the idea of embedding learning outcomes in courses and the idea of mapping across curricula. What I think we can think about is uh, experience mapping. So we think about scaffolding and building uh, core learning outcomes and contents and display specific areas across programs, uh, we need to be thinking about experience in the same way. So how do we scaffold experience and integrated learning experiences across a student's um, higher education experience here? I say that broadly because that mapping might occur in some regards within the academic programs, but I also think that we have to recognize the breadth of opportunity that comes from co-curricular and extracurricular opportunities and consider that within a student's holistic uh, experience map. We need to keep that focus on quality, so constantly asking ourselves in what ways can we enhance existing learning opportunities. It's not just about building more, but it's really keeping that focus on quality at the forefront. Um, and not just how can we build new quality experiences, but how can we continually enhance the quality of what we're already doing. And then finally, the question of access and opportunity. Um, access and opportunity um, is a huge question, again, access to higher education most broadly. If we're defining this as a quality experience, an opportunity, a part of someone's uh, education, we need to keep this at the forefront. So who is engaging? Um, who is not engaging? Why? What are the facilitators? What are the barriers? What are the additional supports for accessibility accommodation that we need to uh, embed? They're not going to be the same as what we embed for traditional classroom-based learning. It is not, oh, do you have an accessibility? We'll connect you with exam writing services and you can write in a different location. Um, there are different barriers. We need more research on what these barriers are and ultimately work going into making sure that these are more accessible um, to the breadth and variety of students that, we that should be engaging in these experiences. And with that, um, what new opportunities may be developed? We have typologies and we're talking about things based off of what we're already doing, the pockets of the great practice that's already happening. Why does it have to stop there? Um, as the field's evolving, let's keep thinking about new. So creating new opportunities, new ways of students engaging in experience, new ways of integrating that experience with their classroom learning. Okay, next one is enhancing integration with the curriculum. So this gets back to uh, my point about, we talk about creating experiences right now that are complementary to what they do in the classroom. They're often set up so that you have uh, your class, you have your disciplinary outcomes, and experience happens at some point in time. Um, we need to think about more critically the multiple ways in which we can integrate experience with the broader academic curricula. I think one of the challenges that we face is that with more attention on more and more and more experience, um, it's going to be easier to develop more experiences that are outside of the academic programming and uh, ultimately had the potential to land us in a more siloed approach in which you have experience happening and then lecture-based education happening. So we need to think more creatively about the multitude of ways in which we actually integrate with curricula. So four ways that I propose. One is a cohesive approach. So this approach um, is 
intended to embed um, multiple experiences uh, across uh, an academic program. And so you might see, um, sorry, um, and so the focus here is on ongoing learning. So you might have similar experiences happen at multiple time points for the sake of extending the length of time that they engage in a particular experience for the sake of ongoing learning across the course of their academic program. The next way we think of it is a scaffolding approach. A scaffolded approach would suggest that you have multiple experiences across an academic program, but these would be intentionally scaffolded in the level of the learning outcomes achieved. And so that might be a bit of an exposure level, maybe in first year, maybe by second, third year, they do a bit of a developed uh, level of experience, uh, they might assist as appropriate, uh, under direct supervision, and then maybe by a fourth year they come in and they're more advanced, uh, and their quality of their work is more independent, they have a bit more autonomy, maybe it's more project-based, uh, contributing in a, in a different way, and more meaningful way to the organization. The third approach uh, to thinking about integration with curriculum is a targeted approach. Uh, this is generally within a very specific course. It's when you t very deliberately tie in an experience to specific learning outcomes of a course. Uh, I think of this traditionally within our service learning courses. Um, and so this is when you have a very rich experience that is heavily connected. This might be when you have an experience in the community. It might pose questions, different ways of thinking, different ideas, and you bring that back to the classroom. And it might even change the topics that you cover in class. Uh, or you have a class on a very specific topic, and they go out and have an experience, and they directly apply the concept that was taught in class the week previous into practice. The last one is a diverse approach, and this talks about when you embed multiple experiences within academic programming, um, intentionally having them engage in diverse experiences. So intentionally with the goal of them being in different settings, different contexts, different populations, to give them a diversity of experiences by the time that they graduate. So again, uh, kind of the theme of most of my comments, there's no one way to do it, but the more that we can think about how you can engage with curriculum, I think the more we can make informed decisions on what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay, innovating new approaches. We spend a lot of time right now talking about the benefits of what's happening, the history of what has been done, how we can improve and enhance what we're currently doing. That can't limit innovation. Um, one of the major outcomes of integrated learning for our students is that it sparks innovation, new thinking, new ideas, new ways of thinking for them. It needs to do the same thing for us. And we can't be doing the same thing today, 10 years from now. And in the same way, I don't believe that what we're doing today is the same as what was happening 10 years ago. So what is innovative is going to be different at every institution and in every disciplinary context. Uh, these here by no means would be innovative to others, uh, but these are just simple examples of what was innovative in my own faculty. So uh, we have a long history of uh, placements in the field of kinesiology and physical education. Uh, they are in their third and fourth year. They have the opportunity to do an unpaid placement. Uh, generally works out to 120 hours over eight months, and they go five hours a week um, out to their um, organization. It can be a school, a sport institute, it can be research with a faculty member. Um, it's unlimited uh, wh where it could actually be. Um, it was new for us. We actually then embedded it within academic courses and built on specific learning outcomes for the courses that were about professional development. So they actually have now content on um, communication theory, on active listening, and we're asked to critically evaluate that content in light of the experiences in the workplace. So that was new for us, um, that deliberate integration um, and just moving away from the assumption of experience for the sake of experience and assuming that experience in itself is automatically beneficial. Um, with that then, I will note that to tie it into the academic rigor and what is needed, um, then we do have the students still engaging in examinations and assignments because when it is academic credit bearing, uh, we, get, uh, we have gotten asked numerous times by the post-secondary um, programs that our students might be applying to, whether or not they would count these courses within their GPA calculation. And so we share our course outlines with everyone all the time. Um, 
to, and also have probably one of the higher standards for academic rigor built into them to show that it is not just an experience only course, but they do have to integrate it with theory. There's lectures, tutorials, et cetera. What is new for us though? This idea of scaffolded placements. So we've been doing this for decades, just sending students out on experience, but it was an experience. Uh, it was initially just a fourth year. Then it was like, would well, be great if they could have two years, if they could do something in third year as well. So yeah, sure, let's open it up to third year. Honestly though, is the exact same level, the exact same, maybe it's two different settings. Um, but there's no difference between a third year and a fourth year student. There's more differences amongst a class and a cohort uh, between the top and bottom of the class than there are between the third and fourth year students. Where we started thinking about scaffolding was when we introduced a new master's program in professional kinesiology. Uh, it's a practice-based graduate program, and it's the first time that we had to start answering what is the difference between undergraduate practice and graduate practice, and how do we actually have advanced um, placements experiences that are advanced beyond what we're offering at the undergraduate level. So for us, it was new and innovative to think about scaffolding in a meaningful way, um, and how we communicate that with our community partners, with the students, and how that transforms then into the differences in the uh, student evaluation, the learning assessments, et cetera. The other big innovative thing that we did in our faculty um, was created what I call a flip placement. So uh, this was also part of our professional master's program, where instead of before sending students out, we have now created five in-house clinics where we bring the clients in. So it's an opportunity for us to deliberately integrate research, education, and service. We took, uh, we paired with researchers in our faculty as an opportunity for knowledge exchange, translation, pick key topic areas, develop programs that were empirically grounded, um, and also opportunities for data collection that could eventually be evaluated and contribute to research long term. It's an educational experience in that the students are the ones facilitating it and running the programs. Um, and we're also providing a meaningful service to the community around us. So the four ar the areas that we created for this, when we have a children and youth, um, what we call structured experiential learning opportunity, where we partner with a local hospital, a children's hospital for um, children that are blind, uh, sorry, low vision, uh, low hearing, autism, and general developmental disability. They're a hospital that does not have a single kinesiologist on staff, single focus on exercise, recognize the need for it. They have a population of 6,000 children uh, who have no access to these services. And so as a part of this, now we have students working one-on-one -on -one paired with these uh, students offering uh, fundamental movement skill development. Other areas include a program we developed for exercise for uh, cancer survivors, one for uh, cardiovascular. We developed a program for uh, enhancing, addressing student mental health across the institution. So all of these, again, are tied back to research programs of in our faculty, areas of research focus. Um, and the students get a, an opportunity to, again, interact with the clients, uh, but in a bit more of a structured and supervised way before they're going out then, and we're expecting them to take on more of a leadership capacity in developing new programs out in the community. The last one, and I know that this is actually very common across other disciplines, but the idea of a capstone and where experience might play into that capstone. This is something that uh, we are talking a lot about. We have some great ideas. In our faculty, we have not been able to move this as as well as I would have liked to. Um, but I also have the pleasure of working on our interfaculty curriculum committee, which is ultimately a partnership between 11 health sciences in which we have a common curricular and learning activities um, provided. So as a part of that working group, we have been able to create uh, community-based learning experiences where students from the 11 health science come together as a part of a team. We partner with a community organization the organization comes in, expresses a community identified need. The students work in an interprofessional team to develop a solution and a project for them and present it then back to that community. Um, this is ultimately a capstone within that interprofessional education curriculum. It, and it's, it builds upon a series of previous individual learning activities. Um, and that has been quite innovative in that uh, it's, it was it's a culminating experience across multiple faculties. Um, funny thing is, is that that was easier to set up than doing it within my own. But <laughs> sometimes you never know where the opportunities um, will lie. Okay, the last one is uh, building ethical partnerships. So uh, partnership development is a huge part of, what of this. Um, when we think of facilitating these experiences, 
It is not just an instructor creating a course, students come and take that course. It is truly facilitated as a <coughs> partnership between the student, the higher education institution, and the community partner. And this community partner um, can be industry, businesses, healthcare facilities, it could be government organization, professional organizations, nonprofit organizations. And obviously, there's quite a bit of difference across these organizations in how you build the partnership and how you facilitate and maintain relations with those partners. Um, there was a recent report that came out by the Conference Board of Canada that talked about uh, building ethical partnerships between higher education institutions and business and community. And in this, they defined the term ethical partnerships. Now, I think that we could critique the word use of the word ethical um, in that I know ethical does mean different things in different contexts. But for the sake of this particular report, they defined ethical as ethical partnerships safeguard learners' interests, build trust and mutual respect, regulate themselves, and make informed decisions that benefit everyone involved. And thinking about some of the complexities of ethical partnerships, some of the things that we need to be considering are as follows. So we think about integrated learning and the purpose of higher education. So if integrated learning experiences were partnering with, an uh, with another organization to facilitate student learning, we're ultimately, in trying to build these partnerships, having to answer the question, well, what is the purpose of our educational programs and why are our students engaging in these? So how do we understand the relationship between um, integrated learning, professionalization, um, and what do we see as the role of the university in preparing students for future careers, and what other roles may we see the, um, as a responsibility institution that we may want to be embedding within these integrated learning experiences. We have to recognize that there's differences across different types of integrated learning partnerships. So what constitutes as ethical in one domain is different than another. I hear lots of questions when we talk about how can we facilitate the ease of partnership development. Um, you hear about common systems, Orbis, Simplicity, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, matching employers with, um, with students. That is one type of partnership development that is very different um, than partnership development that I think of in a practicum setting in which you see yourself as co-educators and you uh, work to uh, collectively develop the learning outcomes I would never be able to imagine posting. Um, so to recognize that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to partnership development. Um, although we use the same terms, partnership development means different things depending on the type of integrated learning in which uh, you are facilitating. We need to talk about who benefits from the partnership. We often use the term mutually beneficial. I use it all the time in our recruitment. Uh, we intend for this to be beneficial for you and for our students. So what do we actually mean by that and how do we actually embrace that so it's just beyond a phrase? So who actually benefits? Um, who benefits, who covers the resources, the time, and what is the impact? Um, I have a colleague that shared an excellent story with me in which we talk about the impact that the students are making for the community and the amount of resources that we go into evaluating that impact. Uh, she worked with an indigenous community organization and that organization explained, you know, as soon as someone's reaching out and asking to send students to partner on a project, uh, they're doing harm. And so that statement in itself um, is quite powerful and poses us to think about what is the harm that we may be even instilling um, in suggesting that we need to be helping. Uh, and the final thing is, is when we talk about a partnership development, we need to uh, openly acknowledge that this is a competitive landscape. There are limited partnerships that exist out there. We are all fighting for the same individuals. Um, you probably hear at U of A have multiple faculties, uh, units, disciplines reaching out to the same individuals. And so then you have, okay, should we do something as an institution to somehow facilitate more broadly? Uh, because keep in mind from the outside, no one cares who kinesiology versus education versus engineering versus business. They just see U of A. So what is the common U of A? face on this, the strength of that is that, yes, that is what would ultimately be more beneficial for a potentially external perspective. The challenge is, though, is that partnership is not an institutional activity. Partnerships are built between individuals and between people. Um, and so we need to recognize that. And so it's how do we actually as an, consider this as an institution 
Um, but recognize that the strength of partnerships comes between the people on the ground that are actually facilitating and making it happen. So some suggestions. Um, this is pulling together several bodies of work. Um, Butin, the uh, list of recommendations on for ethical partnerships by the Conference Board of Canada. Uh, Sefer, as well as a, um, a previous guide that I, I developed, which pulled together some of the literature on this area. Um, suggestions for building effective partnerships. So some of the key areas that are amalgamation of previous literature include relevance, so thinking about the quality education for all stakeholders involved. So that includes the students as well as the um, ourselves, as the facilitators, as well as the uh, partners that we work with. Uh, respect, so balancing power among, among partners, and how do we actually develop uh, trust and genuineness um, in our partnerships. Reciprocity gets to that point of mutually beneficial. Um, how do we have shared objectives? How do we include our partners in not just the facilitation of the activity, but in developing the purpose of the activities, creating the learning objectives, and really seeing them as co-educators in this process? Regulation, more specifically self-regulation. Um, it's the quality of these experiences does not come from external regulation. It comes from the feedback and communication uh, between the higher education institution and the partners directly, um, including students in that feedback loop. And so how do we actually facilitate effective communication um, with the intention to continually seek ways to improve and really embracing that growth mind mindset, uh, suggesting that we're in an enterprise partners for the long term and always looking for ways to improve uh, this experience for all parties involved. And the last one is recognition. Uh, so thinking about uh, how partners share credit for the recognition, so uh, re recognizing the success of the students, um, and that can be our appreciation, um, but also how, do, how is it recognized within their own institutions? How would they like to see it re themselves recognized um, in the context in which uh, they may, be, may need to um, get that recognition? So uh, with a final thought, I, I leave with the closing quote, transformative effects defend, depend on careful planning and execution, uh, avoiding the tendency to fall back on the adage that every experience is educational. So there's a lot of work that goes into developing, facilitating these experiences, and I think this is an excellent and exciting time to be in this field because it is ultimately creating a community of us and as practitioners that will be the force of educational quality and moving this field forward. Okay, thank you. <laughs>